Huh, I have a show to do. I hope this time machine works. Let me grab a time token. Yeah, let's try the 80s. Whoa. I just got back from the 1980s. I saw Madonna at the Palladium in New York City. And then Duran Duran. Oh, uh, the 80s were fun. Oh, you know, let me take a look. Oh, I got to get back to 2021. Let's see what we got. Oh, I'm back in 2021. Oh. Have to use some more hand sanitizer. Today I'm going to use my time machine to take us back in time to look to take a look at some comic books that involve the railroad and the train. It's always been an interesting subject in movies and cartoons and even comic books. So we're going to take a look at train covers today and explore the history. I'm going to use some of my time tokens that I have in my pocket from 1966 and also 1972 and even the 80s so we can see some Silver Age and Bronze Age goodies. So let me gear up, put it into the time machine here, and put the other tokens in there, and then we'll close our eyes. And oh, here's our time capsule. It came right on time, just like the trains do. We're going to pop the lid and take a look at some covers and have a choo-choo good time. Here, opening up the lid of our time travel comic box uh, was a book, The World of Railroads, and also a die-cast iron train. It's actually a pencil sharpener. And this just shows the power of the locomotive and how important it was during an age where this was the primary means of transportation that really shaped America. If we look at our time today with the internet and technology, everything was interconnected. Back then in the 1800s and 1900s and early 19th century, the railroads made small towns into big booming cities, uh, particularly the ones along the Midwest and further west to California. The Union Pacific, for example, and Illinois Central Railroad and Pennsylvania Line all shaped America to what was then like the internet today. And it's also been shown in comic books, and it's also uh, preserved in covers and magnificent action scenes. And I can't remember a time where looking at cartoons where I didn't see a train go by or a damsel in distress tied to the track or action taking place on top of a railroad car. So let's take a look and jump in, and we'll take a look at some books uh, in the queue here. Let's take a look at this first book by Tower Comics. And this is Dynamo, issue number four. It was created in June of 1967. And this is a Wally Wood cover. Wally Wood is uh, best known for working with EC Comics. He was also a founding cartoonist for Mad Magazine, American Humor Magazine, that began in 1952. Mad Magazine was actually the last surviving title of EC Comics and known for the uh, Alfred E. Newman character that usually graced the cover. Wally Wood was always drawing for them and had a prolific career with, with the magazine, but he was very well known for his prowess in the comic book industry, as you can see by this cover that leaps off the page. The steam engine is coming at you full force. You can see Dynamo, the hero, trying to push it back using his famous power belt that he could adjust with a transistor right before the uh, lady in distress. And you can see in the corner there the devious, mischievous uh, nemesis that's uh, planning the whole orchestration. Wally Wood also worked with Marvel, and he introduced uh, Daredevil in the red costume in Daredevil number 7, and created Stiltman, which is a very common protagonist that uh, Daredevil had to fight. But if you look closely at the colors, they were very vivid, and they were believed to be uh, the help of his wife, Tatiana Wood, his first wife, I should say, of three, that was also an artist, and she helped with the backgrounds here and the, the bright colors that pop. 
which you don't really see in some of the earlier comic books. He was considered by his editors to be brilliant in many ways. And Reese was the writer, and he also wrote and did artwork for Flash Gordon and collaborated with Wally Wood and Tower Comics. What's interesting about Tower Comics is typically there are five stories, ten pages in length. We can take a look at the interior, and they just had a nice lush look to them. You could see some of the artwork and action and very polished uh, for the Silver Age. You can see some of the intricate details on buildings and mechanical items, almost like Jack Kirby used to draw the mechanical pieces and motor and machinery. So Tower, the Tower comic had a lot of great talents uh, that came and went, and they were only around for no more than a few years, from 1966 to 1967. Uh, spanning just a few couple of short years there and they're also known for producing undersea agent the thunder agents which was the main line and dynamo to name a few as we stumble upon this particular story it's one of the five stories it's actually uh, co-designed by Steve Ditko Steve Ditko was was the one in charge of pencils but this time unlike the cover where Wally Wood drew the cover he was inking this and one of the neat things about being an inker is you can embellish the pencil work done by the the penciler the artist so can you imagine trying to embellish and make the work greater of Steve Ditko who's the creator of Spider-Man just to get a little comparison this is a, a facsimile copy it's not the exact one but you can see some of the elements that Steve Ditko used was present in this book as well with the small panels in each uh, page and that used to drive Stan Lee nuts because Steve would take his time to make several little panels but wouldn't advance the storyline fast enough to Stan Lee's liking and some of those mini panels became iconic especially when Spider-Man was trapped in the water in a later comic book but let me take a take an example here. You can see the shadow image uh, right on the right hand side, and it kind of parallels what uh, Steve Ditko did before. And you can kind of see that figure here on the right side, and that figure there. So there's some similarities in that style. And if you turn the page in Amazing Fantasy, it's a lot of small panels as well so you can see that uh, reiterated there kind of a style piece so tower comics is something special about it it's, I, I think it's a silver age of a gem uh, because it, it had a lot of other artists moonlighting and passing through as they worked with other comics and included DC Marvel and uh, the like so you can definitely see the the vividness and talent so that's our first train cover Moving along, we'll take a look at our second train cover. That includes an appearance by Wonder Woman. This particular book right here is Wonder Woman 163. It was produced in July of 1966. This is a Ross Andrew uh, Mike Esposito cover. As I alluded to in the last uh, video, that uh, Ross Andrew and Mike worked together a lot on Wonder Woman for several years and they, they always were able to create the action. What makes this cover really pop is not only the bright sprite in the middle but again the blocking of the ink and this is done by the inker adding more layers of ink to the train that was a lot different than golden age books golden age books tended to be more two-dimensional more linear but you can definitely see the the depth created by using the ink here and and then we have the uh, the protagonist's arch enemy paula von gunta paula von gunta is holding wonder woman's bracelet because she hypnotized him to give them to her and ordered her to stop the train that uh, her boyfriend, Steve Trevor, was riding. Upon doing so, she stopped the train, but it was barreling out of control by the sheer force that it was going to fall upon Paula Van Gunta, and she quickly ordered Wonder Woman to stop the train and put it back down, and 
And that's the action we have here. And taking a look through some of the pages, there's a couple stories in here. So Wonder Woman didn't have just one story, but uh, two for the readers to enjoy. You can see Paula is a jewelry thief here and just having her way with uh, the people in the bank. This particular book was written by Robert Canaher, and Robert Canaher was the creator of Sergeant Rock and Sea Devil, and worked as editor for almost 22 years, and worked with Wonder Woman in particular. You can see the kind of that old lore of uh, Golden Age, kind of caricature likeness transitioning to the Silver Age in this book in 1966. Now this is a what I call a, a low-grade copy, a low-grade Leo find from a couple years ago. And as I open the cover, you can see that it's not really connected, so it's a detached cover with some uh, wear and tanning of the pages, some brittleness, the centerfold, uh, doesn't quite stick to the staples. So even though the action is there, as you can see, the book is a, a low grade, but very nicely put together. And even see the name of the person that owned it before. And uh, just a, a great book. It presents well in a bag and board. It shows nice and clean. Only when you take a closer look do you notice any of the... Uh, slight imperfections that I think make it perfect. Next book that we're going to take a look at in our time capsule box from another time is Thor number 319. You can see the train in the background right here, the L track hurling toward the hero and the nemesis here. This time Thor finds himself upon the tracks there, pushing away Zaniac. The, you can closely see the name of the author, uh, Poyard, Keith Poyard, and he was very prolific in the Bronze Age. He actually penciled Thor from issues 286 to 320, and also worked on Spider-Man from 186 to 209. So I think history will tell that he'll go down as one of the more prolific Bronze Age pencilers. This particular book is special because it takes place in Chicago. And in Chicago is the L track and the circle. And it makes a nice little homage to, to the Wrigley building that you could see here in the Magnificent Mile. You see the skyline of Chicago with the Willis Tower, or formerly Sears Tower. But I still call it Sears Tower. And then the uh, water tower on the right. This looks to be the Palm Olive building. And uh, just, just a nice book depicting Chicago in the 80s. Skyline has changed much since then. Even the University of Chicago with the detail there. But what's interesting is uh, we find our hero lifting the tracks, as we're going to thump through here. And another depiction of the train in action. And it never ceases to amaze. Uh, it was kind of a common occurrence to see in cartoons a train being lifted and superhuman strength and, and a source of uh, tension for the, the viewer of what will happen next. Mm, that's pretty grisly there, gnarly. And it's just a great book cover by Keith Poyard. And his, his autograph has always been one that's a little digital look to it. It doesn't necessarily, as the camera focuses, it, it wasn't really penciled or hand-drawn exactly. It just looks like almost like a type typewriter, type graph. Let's look at our next train book in the queue. And that's going to include The Amazing Spider-Man, issue 267. He's on top of a commuter train. And you see the full force uh, speed with the wind in the tunnel. Looks like it could be inside of a tunnel. This particular book came out in 1985. And the cover is by Mike Bright and Kyle Baker. Mike Bright worked on uh, Iron Man Armor Wars number one. 
and also the penciling inside the book was done by Bob McCloud. McCloud had a long stint with DC Comics before joining Marvel where he drew the Green Lantern. But he was also considered the co-creator of the New Mutants with Chris, Chris Claremont. Yeah, Chris Claremont and Bob McCloud, New Mutants that include a lot of uh, characters here including Deadpool. But this here you could see is some of his work uh, beforehand. So a great book. He's, he actually has a brief appearance on the train in the interior of the book as he's hopping along town. Uh, so, so the actual occurrence of the train is less in the book than it is on the cover. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a nice Mark Bright, Kyle Baker cover. You can see the shadow and the light coming from below, illuminating the train and this, just that motion there. Another L track was portrayed even earlier than that book from 1985, and that was in the issue of Marvel, Marvel number nine. Uh, this isn't the actual copy, but a facsimile, a commemorative edition of Marvel comic number nine. And this came out in July of 1940. And you can see the Human Torch battling Namor, or the Submariner as uh, the town is being ravaged behind. You can see the sheer force of, of the Submariner man mangling one of the pillars that holds the train on top and the people alarmed and fearing for their life as the Human Torch has to figure out how to fix the situation. Carl Burgos was a Golden Age cartoonist and illustrator was credited for designing the Human Torch whereas Bill Everett it was credited for the Submariner. And this is the time where the heroes were were in the action, but the anti-hero, such as the Submariner, took the stage. So an anti-hero is, they kind of have their own philosophy of what they think is right. And unfortunately, it doesn't coincide with what the good guys think. So there's a miscommunication of the two powerhouses going at it. And this is an early Marvel story, including Captain America, the three of them, Captain America, Namor, or Submariner, and the Human Torch, make up the Defenders, which later make a debut in their own comic book in the Bronze Age. But this was interesting, as two artists collaborated, Carl Burgos with the Human Torch and Bill Everett with the Submariner, as uh, Namor is taking revenge on New York City. So as you take a look uh, at the book, you can see how the artwork is set, and it's more line-based. You don't see too much depth, you don't see too much blocking or shadowing or contrast, uh, but it's just mostly the lines speaking for themselves, because at this time the artist had to do not only the line work, but the colors, the pencils, and everything together. They didn't pass it off to another person to do the inking. And we can see here an Empire State Building. You can check out the other video that I have below and take a look at the Empire State. So there's another one for that theme. But if you look closely, it's just kind of a raw look to it. It was later perfected in the Silver Age with ink and more layers and shading. And that is the Marvel Comic Train Series. We can't conclude our exploration of trains without looking at Superman number one. Although this isn't the actual number one issue, it's a facsimile that was released uh, later for collectible purposes. This issue uh, depicts the train in, in many ways. You can open up the pages and see here the car stranded on the tracks and Superman coming in to advise the person to get out of the way before lifting him up and letting the train collide. Trains were a dynamic force back then. They represented power, American industry, and not only transportation, but jobs and growth in the connection of the United States. So it's just nice to see that in the Golden Age books here. You can even see that streamlined design of the train here. 
Again, the Golden Age had that nice line work uh, before shading came to be more prevalent in the Silver Age and the black ink coloring. You could see another train with the glow light in front rolling along the track, the motion and that quick strokes of ink going back and forth. So it's just a, a nice thing to see history in comics and comic books taking a notice of of the railroad industry, the train tracks, and just makes for great action. Well, it looks like we're back at our station and time to depart as we took a look at some great train covers. You can see the locomotive and commuter trains and L-track train are represented throughout time in comic book history, from the Silver Age to the Bronze Age, and even the Golden Age where it made a first appearance. So we'll get our time tokens ready for next time and explore new themes from A Blast from a Path. Thank you for watching and enjoy.